Добрый день. Сейчас мы не будем вас долго задерживать, так как я знаю, что вы все курсы на чьи лекции вы пришли, поэтому под ваши аплодисменты я приглашаю на сцену Андреса Винчестера. I really hope no one's going to get away with a half full room like that this time, but still. Uh, folks, welcome. My name is Angus Winchester, and I would start off by thanking you all for coming. But instead, as always, I'm going to start off by apologising. Firstly, I am jet lagged, but so if I go on tangent, if I forget what I'm supposed to be saying and talking about, please cut me some slack. Secondly, to the translators at the back of the room, I am so sorry because I do speak very, very quickly because I'm very passionate about what I do, but I've got theoretically a lot to cover today. Hopefully they'll be able to see the presentation, because there are some words up there that have quite specific meaning, but still. And thirdly, I'm probably going to burn, fart, and swear, for sure. So if swearing does offend you, I would fuck off right now, because it's going to be a bad time for you. So, uh, I am thrilled to be here on the root stage, talking about leadership. Why am I thrilled? Well, for a bunch of reasons. Firstly, of course, I think leadership management, leadership in particular, are very much the foundation of any organization. It doesn't matter, they always say, it doesn't matter how good your team is, if the leadership is not there, things will fail. Because it doesn't matter how good your team is, if the leadership is not strong enough, then you're not setting people up for success. Thirdly, of course, this is a horribly, horribly complex topic. I'm going to talk about leadership. I'm going to talk a little bit about, or more about leadership in bars and restaurants, but this is about leadership in any organization. And of course it's very complex because it's about dealing with human beings and dealing with systems. But I would like to think that what I talk about today is the same whether you're the leader of a sports team or a bar or a restaurant or any business at all. And finally, of course, it's very, very necessary. I trained bartenders for maybe 15 years and I stopped for a bunch of reasons. Firstly, because I think bartenders know an awful lot now about stuff they don't need to know about and not enough about the stuff they really do need to know about. But more importantly, nobody was giving any help at all to managers and owners. And I think this is a group that needs help, it needs support, it needs training, it needs education, it needs inspiration. And so I find that this industry is filled with managers. It's always difficult answering your questions because of course there's a delay with the translators, but how many managers are there in this room at the moment? You know, start managers in the room. Fantastic. How many people here think they're leaders, either in their bar, their restaurant, or their industry? Wow, more leaders than managers. That's quite good. As I'll talk about, you don't have to be in a position of power to be a leader. But obviously, leaders, they're the ones that everyone looks to. They're the ones that everyone wants to be. Nobody wants to be a manager, because let's face it, managers are dull and boring. But they're not. They're necessary. Leaders and managers are slightly different, as I'll talk about today. I'm also thrilled to talk about this not because it's relevant, but because it's relevant to me personally. If you know, I'm looking to open my own bar or restaurant, and if you find my progress, it is delayed horribly. So what I've done in the, well, in the next year, is I've committed to go in and be a bar manager for a bar in New York. This is not a place that I've set up, it's a place that I've inherited. But it gives me a chance to sense check all of the things that I've been coaching other owners and managers about, all the things I've been learning, to see how relevant it is, to see how actually important it is to do, finally how it is actually practically to put into place. So I've come in as a manager, but I've very much realized that there is a gap of leadership within this organization. And so I needed to start looking at how I behave as a leader. Because this is a group of people that weirdly have never heard of me in any way, shape or form. I couldn't go in and say, do you know who I am? Or I'm the seventh most influential person in the bar industry. I was the next bar manager that they had had. A third and fourth in a long line of managers that have gone through quite quickly. So it's been useful to run this session because it's allowed me to set stress the things I've been doing from a practical point of view to make sure that what I'm going to talk about actually works. So, let's get started on this one. So I honestly believe that there are really three types of people in this world. There are people who make things happen. There are other people, the majority of people, who watch things happening. And there's some people who just say, what the fuck just happened? And I'm sure if you think about your managers, they all fall into those three groups. But it's that first group, the group of leaders, the people who make things happen, that I want to sort of focus on and talk about. Is it something that you have to be born with, these innate skills? Or is it something you can actually start to work at, to refine, to get better at, to practice? 
because everything gets better with practice, and there are naturally born leaders. But even they should be coached, even they should constantly check what they're doing to make sure it's relevant. A whole bunch of different words and titles and things like that that are relevant and important for managers and leaders. But terminology is important, and I think we need to remember the words that we're using and not necessarily get them mixed up. First off, of course, teachers. Teachers are people who actually teach people. They're normally employed to be teachers, and within our industry, they're trainers. You don't have to be a great bartender to be a great teacher, to be a great trainer. But these are people who very specifically get you from one state to another, to not know how to do something, to be able to do something. And a teacher is massively important, of course. The next word, relatively badly used and misused, is mentor. A mentor is a wise, trusted person who provides advice for you. But a lot of the time, they're not directly involved in your career. I actually find it more important to find mentors who aren't my bosses. Mentors who aren't in the same organization as me, or at least in my chain of command. Because they don't have a vested interest in me. They literally want to provide help, advice, experience, to talk about how and why they do those things. So I can use them without necessarily their success doesn't depend on me, and my success doesn't depend on them. And I think mentor is someone that may not be in your industry, but you just admire them as a person, you think they have certain qualities that you would like to learn from. Then we have heroes. Heroes, of course, are these idealized people that we look out for. Maybe they're incredible sporting achievements, maybe they just seem like wonderful people, and heroes are generally fictional on the whole. I think the thing about heroes is we tend to put them on a pedestal. If you put anybody on a pedestal, be prepared to catch them, because nobody is perfect. They will fall off and you need to make sure that you don't invest too much time and effort within them. Then, of course, we have managers. Our industry is filled with managers, bar managers, HR managers, general managers, operations managers. Managers are more about the process. They're about making sure that the systems that exist within your company or within your organization are followed. They make sure the systems don't break down, and to a certain extent, they just direct people. But what we're really thinking about today are leaders. And leaders are motivators. Leaders are inspiring people. Leaders in your business are the people who give you a reason to come to work, or as managers, just give you a place to come to work. And it is, if you work with a great leader, and it could have been someone that you had at school, a teacher is often your first great leader, because they inspire you, they open up your eyes, they give you a reason to pay attention, as opposed to everybody else who just seems to be going through the motions to earn themselves a paycheck. So, let's talk about managers and leaders. We have lots of managers in our industry. Not many leaders. Interestingly, I was talking to Robert Simonson before I came on, and he said, who are you going to give examples as leaders? <coughs> and it took me a little bit of time. I couldn't think of a list of people. Managers, easy. But good managers, easy. But for leaders, people who truly inspire and follow all the categories I talk about, there are very, very few people, I think, within our industry who qualify for all of these things. But managers, as I said, very much focus on the things. They make sure that things that are supposed to be done are done and they are done right. They plan, they organize, they direct, they control. So these things are all important. And we need help from managers as well to make sure that they understand they can do these things right. Whereas leaders are more about the people. They're more about the health and the culture within an organization. I'm not saying that managers can't be leaders. Like I'm not saying that leaders can't be managers. So a lot of the time leaders possess different skills that make this sense of control is slightly more different. The other thing, of course, people talk about is bosses. Whereas managers are important, bosses are toxic. People who claim credit, give blame. People who say, do it my way, and don't explain why. People who use I, I do this, I do that. And interestingly, I think I've followed on from a lot of bosses in the current job I'm taking. Because they're surprised that I'm happy to let other people take control of important parts, coming up with the cocktails. I haven't changed my cocktail list. Why? I have no idea what people like in this bar, so I'm not going to put my cocktail list in until I find that. Whereas the bartenders and the head bartender have been working there for the last two years. They know what people want. So why should I put a cocktail list in without doing that research? Because I'm the boss. No, I'm not. I'm the leader and manager of this organization. So the idea that the bosses, and I think we all know bad bosses. I was brought up with bad bosses. When I was a young bartender, I was told about the chain of command. 
and that was a chain that I would be beaten to death with if I didn't do what the manager told me to do. The idea of if I wanted your opinion, I would have given it to you. It was very much a standard for us, but with new generations now, I'm not going to call them millennials or Generation Y, the idea of explaining and involving, bringing people along is the key to what successful bars and restaurants and businesses look like nowadays. But I would say that you don't have to be in charge to be a leader. The fact that more people put up their hands as leaders and managers shows this to be the case. I don't know how many people know this. This is a gentleman called Ali Sonko. Ali Sonko is a dishwasher. Well, he was a dishwasher. For 14 years, he was a dishwasher at Noma, one of the best restaurants in the world. And yet, he is now a 10% partner in the holding company of Noma because he was seen as embodying the qualities that Noma admires. When they won their first best restaurant in the year, he's from Gambia, lived in Denmark. He couldn't get a visa to go to London for the awards. So when they turned up to accept the awards, they all had t-shirts with his picture on it. The next year when they won it, they sent him up on stage to collect the award for the world's best restaurant. He's a dishwasher, but he's not. I've met him several times and I've never seen him not smile. He realizes the importance of his job. More importantly, he brings an incredible culture and enthusiasm to the business, which is what they really felt they needed more of. But more importantly, they needed to show that this was an organization that would recognize anybody within the organization, no matter how small and insignificant, as being an important part of it. I think that's great leadership as well to acknowledge him, because it does show that we live in complex machines. And even if one small cog doesn't work right, the whole organization will grind to a halt. So you don't have to be the manager, you don't have to be the owner, you don't have to be the head bartender within our industry in order to be considered a leader. And it's important for you to look at people within your business, especially if you're going into an established business to identify the leaders. Who are the people that the other staff look up to? Who are the people that can be used as an example or a role model to inspire people to continue to raise their game? So, another model of leadership, and this is one that anyone who's studied leadership will know, is what's called the John Wooden uh, model of leadership. Any basketball fans may have heard of John Wooden. John Wooden was a basketball coach at UCLA, and is considered the most winningest coach in sports history, because he won 12 championships, no, 10 championships in 12 years, including seven in a row. And that's never been done before, and never been done again. He recruited some of the greatest players in modern basketball, and he did it not by telling people he was going to turn them into better basketball players, but by showing this model, this math, and saying, this is what I will teach your children if they come and play basketball with me. Because it's about teamwork, it's about success, and this has now been applied within business and motivational talks and other organizations. And this was about basketball. You can download it, study it at great depth, because it talks about the lessons of leadership and the building blocks by which to create a great team, but by association that a great leader needs to have and be aware of in order to build that team. Because that's what we're really talking about. But we're also talking about the fact that leaders are inspirational. A lot of people say, what do leaders do? They inspire. They inspire to you to try harder. In our industry, they inspire you to serve a customer, the last customer of the night, with as much enthusiasm and skill as you do the first customer in the evening. So of course, looking to inspire, and looking to try and make training sessions and education sessions like this in some way relevant and easy to remember, I used that idea of inspire and took the letters I-N-S-P-I-R-E as being the basis of the skills I think you need that good leaders have or need to be developed in order to grow your leadership skills. So the first I stands for integrity. And integrity is a massively important thing. I feel that someone's integrity is your own personal reputation. This is your brand. And integrity, if you don't know what it means, is the quality of being honest. The quality of having strong moral convictions that you won't necessarily change just because it's a bit hard to maintain. I have a reputation for being slightly grumpy within our industry. I have a reputation for saying, I think that's shit, if it's shit. But as I say, I can base it on facts, but more importantly, I have my own qualities and integrity that helps me navigate the complicated world that we live in. And having a manager with integrity, having an owner or a leader with integrity, that is the key to it for a bunch of reasons. 
It's about being consistent in private as well as in public. And I think we all know there are certain leaders, politicians, religious leaders, they will say one thing and then do another, because they lack that sense of integrity. But I, in my personal life and my professional life, am consistent. But that, of course, makes me trustworthy, because you know how I'm going to act. You know what I like and what I don't like. The fact that Babis stood here and apologised for being late, because he knows that punctuality is so important to me. They said, you could start in 10 minutes' time. I said, no, I'm starting in two minutes' time, because that's when I said I would start. And that's important to me. I had to cut my presentation down because I started late. No, I wouldn't start late. I'd start on time, and if I run out of time, that's the way it goes. So it's about being trustworthy. And to a certain extent, it is about my core values. Core values are important for any organisation. Core values are the qualities that an organisation has core values. They're the characteristics of the people that I will try and hire. Because if everyone who works for me believes the same thing, then it's a lot easier to make people do things. Because they believe the same things that I do. They believe and have agreed to sign up to a contract, effectively, to behave in a way that is consistent. So I've written down my core values, because when I'm hiring people, this is what I use. I ask people, is this you? And more importantly, as we know in job interviews, it's not like a first date, I ask you a question, you try and figure out the answer that I'm looking for. When I ask people about core values, I ask them to tell me a story about how this core value appears in their life, why they feel it's important. And my core values are my core values. This is an example of them. Man is vital at all times, punctuality ditto. Because as I say, punctuality starting on time, finishing on time, turning up on time, whether it's for a job interview or for a date or anything, is important. But this is what I believe. I believe life is about serving people more than yourself. I look every day for ways that I can help someone out. Whether it's always having five US dollars in my pocket, so as I walk around, I've always got a dollar to give someone when they're begging on the street. Even though they're probably using it to buy crack, it doesn't matter. Because maybe they need it for food, etc. The idea of manners, you never learn less. I love learning things. I think it's so important to constantly be learning things. And asking people, what was the last thing you learned? What was the last thing you taught someone, for example? You can't improve what you can't measure. If you can't measure something, it's difficult to figure out that you're doing better with it. And it may seem odd, but it's something that is important to me. Be the best at what you do. It doesn't matter what job you do. It matters how you do that job. From the dishwasher to the street sweeper to the head bar vendor to the owner. Do it as well as you possibly can. Don't think your job is as important. Continue to do that and you'll see from a leadership point of view to let people know how important their job is, even if they are just the person sweeping the streets. I love the story of John F. Kennedy wandering around NASA when they had the bold plan to send a man to the moon that was so unbelievably far-fetched and nobody knew what was going to go on. And the astronauts were cool rock stars and the scientists were rocket scientists, but he walks around the corner as he's been showing as he's been shown around the facility and he bumps into a guy with a broom sweeping the floor. And you know, like put it back, he's like, oh, so what do you do here? And this guy who's sweeping the script, sweeping the laboratory looked at him and said, I'm helping you put a man on the moon, Mr. President. And that's an important thing. Everybody in the organization's job matters. And you need to let them know that. The idea of doing the right thing and doing the thing right, and of course, don't be a dick, which is, seems very simple, but I think an awful lot of people seem to forget these don't be a dick rule. So as I, this is the idea of my values. If you understand this, then you know what working with me is going to be like. You know what expectations I will have for you. I am consistent. I live to these values, and this is what has made me the person that I am today, and, by association, the professional that I am today. The next thing good learners, good leaders do, of course, is they nurture people. They look after the people around them. Getting to know who works for you. That was the first thing I did when I came to work. I'm like, who are you? How long have you worked here? What do you like doing? To get to know them as people, because they are people. They're not bartenders, they're Enrique. They're not hosts, they're Vanessa. So to look at the people who work with you, the people around you, and getting to know them is important, because of course, if you want to motivate someone, you need to know what motivates them. Caring about them as people. I asked what they're doing this weekend that I remember. And I asked them, I asked them about their family. I asked them about what they like. I had a situation the other day where somebody came in, uh, one of my cocktail servers, and she sent an email saying, 
hey, I'm suffering slightly from like anxiety attacks and panic attacks at the moment, so you know, if I'm a bit freaked out when I get to work, you know, cut me some slack. And she turned up and tears in her eyes, you know, looking all intense. I said, look, let's go and sit down. And we sat down and I talked about her dog, because I know she likes dogs. I got her talking about something she likes and talked about <coughs> nonsense for 12, 15 minutes, just to calm her down. Yes, on one hand, I wanted her to work that shift. So I wanted her to be in proper form to be able to do so, but more importantly, I cared about her as a person. Panic attacks, anxiety attacks, depression, all of these things are real problems. And I care about someone, I care about the people who work for me, for that point of view, not just that she was a great cocktail server and I didn't want to have to cover the shift, etc. Understanding people's goals. I ask people, I'm sure you don't want to come and work with me for the next 45 years and then retire. What do you want to do? What do you want to do in your life? Like personally, professionally, what's your goal for this year? Because a goal is just a dream with a deadline. And if you help people by understanding what motivates them, what they like doing, what they would prefer to be doing, or more importantly, what they want to do in five years' time, it's a lot easier to win them over as people. And so they start to trust you because you've shown that you care for them. Help them to set their goals. Yes, they might want to be the winner of world class. And you may say, within the next year, that could be a little bit challenging. But let's work, let's break it down into small little components first. Let's help you get those goals, let's help you set those goals. But their goal is not to just to be a better bartender, a better server, or to make me money. He's a human being. And you want to lead people, you better understand the people that you're trying to lead. Also, don't just focus on work. I'm sure all of you have attended training sessions as part of your bar or restaurant about bourbon, about cocktail, about scotch, things like that. But we start to offer training sessions on personal finance, in terms of how to save money, how to budget. We run sessions on how to look after your body, to make sure that you eat properly, to make sure that you can hydrate properly, to make sure that you're not getting too drunk too often. We run sessions on how to buy houses. We run sessions on parenting, because apparently babies don't come with training manuals. Whereas to get experienced parents to come in and talk to staff who just had children, that helps by caring about people as people, not just having an opportunity to teach them more about whiskey or gin or vodka or throwing of cocktails or vegan cocktails or whatever it may be. That may be important, but if you show care to the people who work for you as human beings, they will react in a way that is significantly different. And also, you need to be vulnerable. You need to talk about your history, you need to talk about the mistakes that you've made. And also, you, a lot of the time, you need to go first. To stand up and express what could be seen as embarrassing about the biggest mistake you've made, or the biggest life lesson you had, or your goals or aspirations. And the best way for all of this, quite simply, is to get people to give it some thought and write it down. So we often do what's called a vision board. And a vision board is just a sheet of paper that we put together that asks you, what is your personal goal for this year? What is your professional goal for this year? What are you going to do for your family this year? What are you going to do for your community this year? And also to find out other things about them that could help bind people together as a team, but also to find out more information about them. So this was just something I put together last year, actually. You know, my goal, I'm recently married, and my goal was to move myself and my wife to New York City. She'd never lived there before. She was a little bit nervous about leaving her home region, etc. So that was my goal, to move us there successfully. My personal goal was to stop smoking, which stopping smoking is easy. I've done it hundreds of times. Continuing to not smoke is slightly more difficult. The idea of my career was, at that time, to get my bar, which I still thought was going to be open soon, into the top 50 list. Uh, my quote, you never learn less, as you've heard me say once before already, but also desiderata which is an incredible, not really a poem, like a piece of prose all about helping me maintain integrity and poise and a bunch of other things as well. My favorite songs, my heroes, David Beckham. Why? Because this is a guy who not just had incredible talent, but incredible dedication. The first person on the football pitch for training, the last person off it. He loved his family, he does great stuff. And yeah, David Beckham, isn't that a bit cheesy? Shouldn't I like Harry Johnson or Jerry Thomas or someone like that? But no, in my community, Tinson is a company in the UK that does shoe cutting, I don't know, key cutting and shoe repair. 
But one of the things they do is 35% of the people who work for them have good criminal records, have come out of prison. And I don't know if anybody here has been in prison, but apparently, if you've been in prison for anything, getting a job afterwards is really difficult. And yet, actually, a lot of good people who made a mistake went to prison and come out, and nobody will give them a job. Tips and does. And I think it's really clever to look at ex-inmates because they try twice as hard, and a lot of the time they are clever, talented, passionate people who just made a mistake. So that's what I want to do with my community to help inmates to potentially bring them in and start training in my bar. The next thing, I said speak, because it's I-N-S. I really should have said communicate, because great leaders are great communicators in many different ways. But basically, regular, clear communication. Great leaders are very good at explaining what and why and how, very simply. I'm maybe not a great leader because I talk very fast and people don't understand what I'm saying and I use a lot of strange words, but great leaders are great, clear communicators. They're also honest. I like to think of myself as honest, occasionally maybe I'm too honest, but I can't not be honest. If you ask me my opinion, I will tell you. If you are fucking up, I will tell you. I won't just fire you, but I'll tell you in advance. I'll say, look, you're really fucking up at the moment. You really need to pull your act together. This is what you need to do to stop fucking up. And yet, that's a hard conversation. I will tell people, you really need to put more deodorant on. That is a hard conversation to have with people. But good leaders are no problem with honesty. Because that's the only way to be. You can't be honest sometimes, but not others. When people say to me, well, to be honest, I'm like, oh, is this like Simon says, that if you don't say, to be honest, then you're not being honest with me? I've only got one mode, which is honesty. And it gets me into trouble, but again, you can trust what I'm saying, and people will admire that. Regular recognition. Now, I've screwed this one up, I shouldn't say how good these things. Regular recognition means basically, if you see someone in your organization who's doing good stuff, tell them. And tell them straight away. Doesn't matter how small it is. It, could, it might just be that they're doing the job in the way that you would hope them to be. But to regularly say, oh, well done, or I heard that telephone conversation, or that hotel looks great. They're really good at communicating small compliments. I have an email thing that pops up every Friday at 2 o'clock. I was actually on an aeroplane this, this Friday, so I didn't get it, which is says gratitude. And it reminds me to send out three emails to three people that I've interacted with to basically say thank you. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for that small little thing you did. And it could be the woman in the coffee shop who smiles at me every day I go into coffee and now remembers my order. It could be the delivery driver who's just always a little bit more helpful than the other delivery drivers. But if you start looking for those three people that you're going to send an email to or about, then you start seeing more and more good. But you need to say straight away, well oh, done, that was good. Even if it's just doing what you were supposed to be doing. Have good meetings, by the way, is important. I find all the whole bar meetings and restaurant meetings are, pardon my friends, a complete goat fuck most of the time. Because we weren't trained how to have good meetings. To set out an agenda to say, this is what we're going to talk about. If you have any thoughts about it, start thinking about it now. To then keep to that agenda, or add things to it beforehand. To keep it to the right amount of time to have the right people in place to start off with, and if they're not needed in the meeting, send them away so they don't sit there listening to information that's not important to them. Bar meetings can be really useful and really practical if run well. Relevant communication. Telling people what they need to know, not confusing them with lots of things they don't need to know. Back of house, front of house, kitchen versus hosts. Make it relevant, make it important, but as I say, also make it timely. Any Simon Sinek fans in the room, and Simon Sinek is becoming increasingly cool, yeah, start with why. First thing I did when I came along into this job is to sit with all the hosts and all the bartenders and all the servers and the server assistants and the food runners and everybody and explain why they were doing this job. Why the hosts should smile when people walk through the door and say goodbye when they leave. Why they should do this, why they should do that. Not what they needed to do. So I started off with, you are not bringing people a cocktail, you are providing them with an experience, you're going to be part of hopefully the greatest night of their life. And if you start with that idea, people re behave and react in a different way. Explain things. One of my great 
friends, and probably the only person I have truly put up and say, this is one of the great leaders of our industry. There's a guy from Houston, Texas, called Bobby Hugel. I'm more of a fanboy of Bobby Hugel, because I think he's brilliant at what he does. And he said, I do this little thing with bartenders and staff occasionally. What about communication? That I say to bartenders, tonight, I don't want you to use the word no. Somebody asks if you've got a Bud Light, you don't say no, you say, I'm really sorry, so we don't actually cover any commercial beers, but we do have this one that's similar. And just getting people to think about taking the word no out of their vocabulary, to think about the way they speak, is a, a nice little thing. He gets his managers to say, don't do an order, don't tell someone to do anything tonight, but spend the week asking them, could you do this for me, could you do that for me, as opposed to do this or do that. And for an owner, he said he spends the entire month, he doesn't make a single decision without explaining why he's made that decision to the people that it impacts. And I think explaining to people why this is important, explaining to yourself how bars make and lose money, explaining how much money everybody makes, it's part of honesty. Why are you embarrassed to tell people about this? But it's today, having that sense of explaining is important. And also listening. Great leaders listen to people. They don't just hear them, they listen to them. They sit down, they have regular meetings, so they get feedback about how they're doing, about their worries, about what they see in the organization, or the team, or whatever it may be. So this isn't just speak, this is really communicate. Be a great communicator. Great, clearly putting across the right information at the right time, and at the same time, listening to people on a regular basis. Next one, and this is difficult for some people, is poise. Poise to a certain extent is calmness. Great leaders don't get flustered. Great leaders don't panic. Great leaders don't get angry in the middle of situations. Because when there's a problem, what you really want is the person you rely on to be calm. To say, okay, yeah, that sounds terrible. Like if somebody's on fire, then maybe they're going to move slightly quickly. But in general, there is no problem that can't be fixed. And yet, it may be hard, it may be difficult, it may be embarrassing. But the idea of just working the problem out, rather than panicking about it, shouting, screaming, apportioning blame, why did you do this? What's the point of asking someone, why did they do this? The idea of just being calm, having that confidence so that you look up to this person and you say, okay, I know they're not going to get mad now, later on, there may be a difficult conversation, but now you're going to have that calmness. So it's a self-assurance, it's calm, it's grace. It's the way people behave so that they don't lose their temper, lose their top, and that you know how people are going to behave, a certain sort of dignity. It comes across with confidence that you know that there is no problem that can't be sorted out, and that things will work out the way they're supposed to. Maybe that in 10 years' time, nobody's going to remember the fact that you just tipped this, you know, beetroot cocktail or in their white Gucci suit, etc. Right now, it seems important. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not that important. And it also comes from experience. You try at least pretend that there's no situation that hasn't happened to you before. I can deal with this, I've, had, I've seen it before, it's happened to me before. You also, to a certain extent, you'll take responsibility for things. So, my staff at the moment love it because I've got their back. They say that a lot, it's like, I like it because you've got my back. If something goes wrong, you will step in and you will help sort it out. You won't say, I'm sorry if it's the bartender's fault. I'm sorry the kitchen fucked up again. It is that sense of like, so sorry that happened, let me calm you down, let me turn it round, whatever it may be. It builds trust and confidence. If you're not a panicker, if you don't shout, if you don't swear, if you don't raise your voice, People just trust more in what you're saying. And it's important, and it's a very difficult policy, because the higher level you lead, the more things do fuck up, and often the more important these fuck ups are. But, if you take a deep breath, if you practice all the things that you need to be able to develop poise, then you will come across, at least, as a better manager. The next thing is, thing is initiate, you start things. Leadership, the name implies that you're out front, that there are people following you, etc. So you need to be clear about moving forward. There are too many managers that look at social media reviews, they look at the figures from last week, which is like driving a car by looking in the rearview mirror. It's about looking forward constantly. And that's what great leaders do. You know, they talk about motivate and inspire, they also innovate. 
And you don't just innovate because you react to a situation. Great leaders are always looking forward. I always call myself the what-if guy. What if we try this? What if we try that? Rather than, you know, you're broke, don't try and fix it. But making things happen. We talked about it before. Great leaders make things happen. They start things. They don't just react to, of course, if there's a problem, they'll react to that. They're trying to head off any problems before they happen. They're looking to improve a situation. They're looking to learn from other areas and other bits of businesses to be able to do this. Looking forward constantly, not looking back, because our industry is very, very fast moving. And if you just say, everything's cool, let's just chill out for the next three months, then all of a sudden other people are getting ahead of you, and the problems that are very small start to become very big. The idea of looking forward, spotting opportunities, and potential improvements. I probably talked last time I was here about a gentleman called David Brailsford. Sir David Brailsford, as he is now, is huge in the cycling world. So if there are any cyclists here, David Brailsford used to run the Sky Tour de France team, a cycling team. He also did the Great Britain cycling team, but he had a principle called marginal gains. And marginal gains was saying, okay, these are Olympic athletes. But, how could we improve them, if only in tiny ways? So for his Tour de France team, it's three weeks long, they stay in, sleep in three weeks with the hotels. But rather than relying on that hotel to have a lovely mattress, or thinking that everybody could sleep on the same mattress, he looked at the temperature in a hotel room, the mattresses, the pillow type, everything to do with how his athletes slept. And he found if they slept a little bit better, they cycled a little bit faster. Maybe only half a percent faster, but that's still half a percent. Then he found out about eating and hydrating, and found out about a whole bunch of other things, and had a half percent here, a quarter percent there, one percent here. All of a sudden, his cyclists were cycling 10 percent better. Which, if you're a super, supreme athlete, doing something 10 percent better is going to lead to awards, which is exactly what he's got. Your business is constantly looking, how can I improve the people, processes, whatever it may be, constantly looking for improvements. And that's what leaders often do. They're very good at starting things, but we're all very good at starting things. They're also generally very good at finishing things. And we suck at finishing things. I'm sure you all started loads of stuff, and I'm sure when you leave this, you'll go out with 10 great ideas that I talk about, and start doing the work on Monday. But then on Tuesday, something will come up and you'll get in the way of doing it and you'll forget about it and it'll just drag on until it dies by the side of the road. Great leaders don't try and do too much, but they start and they finish. Be curious, ask questions. I'm doing that a lot in my business at the moment. Why do we do it this? Why do we do it like that? What's, what, explain it to me. And a lot of the time people are like, well, I don't know, it's the way we've always done it which is the opposite of great leadership. Doing it because that's the way we've always done it is a way road and a race to the bottom. And the last thing to, you know, to do with initiate is be persistent because a lot of the stuff you do will fail. But the most successful people in the world fail the most because they try something, it doesn't work. And rather than give up, they say, okay, well that didn't work. Maybe if I tried it like this, maybe that doesn't work. So let me try it again a little bit of a different way. And you keep on going through the most persistent people, the most successful people. Fail, perhaps more than they succeed, they don't give up. Falling down is failing, not getting up is failing. Responsible. Great leaders are responsible. They own the situation. If my bar and my team perform well, it's down to me. If my bar and my bar team don't perform well, it's down to me even though I've just taken over the bar. They screw up, it's my fault, because I obviously didn't train them properly, I didn't motivate them properly, I didn't explain it properly, or I let the system fail them. But I own it, I am responsible. And a lot of, a lot of leaders aren't. A lot of managers aren't, it's not my fault. It's the kitchen's fault, it's the last bar manager's fault, etc. I run that bar, it is my responsibility. I'm self-aware, I realize I'm not perfect, but, a lot of people don't. If you keep working in bars but keep going fast and keep screwing up, it could be your fault. So being aware of your strengths and your limitations, to be honest to yourself, which is one of the reasons I have mentors, so I can speak to someone who's not my boss, who's not my manager, 
to someone that I can say, am I, am I wrong here? Am I screwing up here? It's just, how can I change this, etc. Set clear expectations. If you want people to do things, you have to tell them exactly what you need them to do. You need to say why it's important. You need to set them proper levels of expectation that make it clear. Set clear targets and also measure things constantly. I love measurement because if I've got a needle, think of a dashboard in a car, it tells me everything I need to know. If this needle goes too low, I run out of petrol and then the car stops. If it goes too far that way, I'm driving too fast and now all of a sudden I'm going to get arrested by the police. I set a clear set of dashboards for all the things that really matter in my business. And I know if something I try makes the needle go in the right way, I want to do more of that. If it goes in the wrong way, I need to stop doing that and don't do that sort of thing again. But it's about that sense of responsibility. If you can't do it less, you have that sense of measurement. The last bit, the last thing is energy management. So this is really about should we say, the real motivation aspect. And motivation, somebody once said, motivation wears off. And I'm, yeah, of course it does. So does showering. That's why you do it every day. You need to motivate people every day. You need to have a communication with them, a conversation with them, make them laugh, make them smile, give them success stories and things like that in order to make them recharge their batteries. What I tend to do is, firstly, I tend to measure everybody. I've got seven bartenders. I've got the quickest bartender and the slowest bartender. I've got the most accurate bartender and the least accurate bartender. I've got the most friendly bartender and the least friendly bartender. Friendly is a little bit difficult, but everything else I can measure. It doesn't matter how many bartenders, servers, waiters, people in the kitchen. If you measure them, you will have a best and you will have a worst. But as long as you can make it easy to see what people need to do to move from best to worst. As long as you explain that you may be the tenth best bartender here, that you are better than the first best bartender in another bar, but here's what you need to do to improve is important. A lot of people, when they do look at bartenders, do look at servers, they focus on the worst ones. Then we need to bring you up. But you need to focus on them to bring them up. But you need to look at the top people as well. Because top performers like to challenge themselves. They like to be learning new things. They like to be constantly challenged and coached. A lot of the time, we just focus on the people that are fucking up rather than the people that are doing really good work. And that sucks the energy out of your best people. You want to attract the best people because even if they're fresh best, they realize they can get better working with you. Regular recognition of success at every level. How many people here do any sort of like staff awards? in terms of like, this is the best person in our organization. Employee of the month in McDonald's and stuff like that, I mean, it's set by the managers and everyone wins it every time, you know, every, over the course of the year, two years, everyone's gonna win it. We do what's called peer-to-peer -peer awards, where the team votes about who they think is the best person who runs within that organization. But also every email we get that says, oh, I was in your bar last night, Kevin the bartender was great, we make sure that Kevin and the rest of the team know about that feedback that came back. Because it does make people stand a little bit straighter, try a little bit harder, feel a little bit more positive. We don't just take credit and say it was a busy night. We say this person in particular did great stuff. <coughs> Give me honest feedback. We've talked about it before. Honesty and feedback are key in this. Letting people know how they're doing so that they can improve. And that if they don't improve, things may happen. You may want a job where you just come in, rip the necks off bottles and try and track your customers. It's not wrong. That's just not going to work working for me. So either you change your attitude or you find another place to work. I'm not firing you because you're bad. I'm firing you because, well, I'm not even firing you. I'm freeing up your future for other opportunities because it's not going to work working for our organization. Having a positive outlook. This is really difficult. I used to be a realist. And if you're a realist, life is the reason is like shit. There's a lot of bad stuff going on out there, but there is good stuff. You need to start to look for the good stuff, the small moments of beauty, the small things that you can say, okay, you guys are crap, but that was really good. Well done. And I've started to really look for the positives. I've tried to enjoy a bad situation, because however bad it is, it'll still make an amusing story when I'm telling people about it later on. But having that sense of a positive outlook that things will get better that all of this stuff has been seen by somebody before, that it's not really going to matter in the grand scheme of things, that you're healthy, that you're not 
mining salt in Siberia or whatever it may be. Having that positive outlook and demeanor is the key to being able to then feed the people around you because they do feed off your attitude. You know it in your personal relations. If you're in a bad mood, your girlfriend or boyfriend is a bit like, mm, okay. Whereas if you're positive, you're very happy, people respond to that and it creates just an upbringing of positivity. But, inspired, that sounds great. But in the real world, back in the real world, how does this shit really work? Well, it's interesting that when I started studying the management of bars, the business of bars, I started to look outside our industry and I found this concept called engagement. And it is my new fixation in the way that gin was my fixation 20 years ago. Engagement is all about basically the purpose of your business. And do the people who work for you believe in that purpose? Are you giving them just a place to work or are you giving them a place where they can come to work and it feeds the stuff that they like doing? Anybody here know any nurses? I've got some friends who are nurses. And I used to ask them, how was your day at work? And they would tell me the most horrific stories of a little old lady bought in and she had no living relatives and she'd fallen over and she'd been on the floor for two days and she lay there in the hospital bed and then she died. And I'm like, oh, God me, I, I thought the customer who said his bloody Mary wasn't spicy enough was bad news. But what I realised is that they were happy that they had been there to give some care to this woman at the end. That she may have no relatives, but she died holding the hand of someone who cared for her. People don't become nurses because they like access to free drugs or because there's no other job to do. People become nurses because it makes them feel good that they're helping in this world. And that's what engagement is. Engagement's not holding the hand of dead old ladies. Engagement is providing a space where you say, this is why this space exists, and then attracting people who that resonates with them. And it turns out that if you have good leadership, you're good at communicating that, so it leads to higher engagement. And engagement leads to higher profits, lower absenteeism, uh, better productivity, better reviews on social media and things like that. And it turns out that you can measure engagement. So of course I looked at this idea of measuring engagement as potentially a way of measuring your leadership skills. Because the Q12 survey is the most popular way of measuring engagement. I talked about this a couple of years ago. These are 12 questions that you ask your staff anonymously. You give them a form. If you've got a big bar or restaurant, you may have restaurants and kitchen and bar and host and dorm. And so you can see how engaged the different groups are. If not, you leave that off entirely. You just give it to your 15 staff and say, fill this in anonymously. I don't want you to write down why you're answering yes or no. Just tick a box, yes or no. These are theoretically the 12 questions that will measure engagement. It's been, the survey has been used by Gallup, the massive polling organization, for close on 70 years now. They now do it around the world. And you can measure the levels of engagement in different countries. So, you know, Vietnam, everyone there loves their job. Maybe because they didn't have, they have jobs before, or now they're earning a lot more money, but they really love their job. They feel a sense of purpose for their job. So when I got this, it was a useful thing. And I would not now consult for any bar or restaurant that wasn't prepared to run a Q12 survey. Because this is a sense of, do people not like working here? Because they probably like working in shit bars where they can steal your vodka and you know, do lunch cocaine behind the bar. They love that. Doesn't mean they're engaged with it. They may be satisfied working there because it's an easy job. They get well paid for. But engagement is about, do they feel a connection with what you're trying to do? And more importantly, do you feel four basic human emotions? Do you feel that this job gives you growth? Are you learning things here? Are you becoming more because of working here? Secondly, trust. Do I trust the people I'm working with? Do I trust the people I'm working for? Of course, if you can answer yes to both of those questions, then you're going to work harder. You're going to be more lively in coming to work. Thirdly, recognition. Will I be recognized if I work hard? Will my success, will our success be credited to the right people or will the bosses just take the credit for it? And finally, communication. Can I express an opinion? Will it be listened to? Do I know why things are going on? If your manager comes in and shouts at you because the numbers are bad but never explains what these numbers are, then you feel that's a little bit unfair. 
Whereas the practice of open book management to explain how bars make and lose money, to explain how much the manager is paid and the owner and rent and rates and all of these things, so they can understand this is important. So, 12 simple questions, but when you run this for the first time, and I've talked about it before, I don't know whether anybody's run it, people tend to be, owners in particular, they're like, oh yeah, my staff love working here, they're going to answer yes to all 12 questions. And then when they get the results back and they didn't get consistent yes to all 12 questions, they're like, who the fuck am I going to fire? Like, who's working? I can't believe these traitors. I can't believe they did this. But when you start saying, okay, well, what are you doing to make people say yes to this? You know, uh, for example, the mission or purpose of my company makes me feel my job is important. Do you have your mission or purpose written down? Did you explain it to people? Or do you just, you know, do all the missions to make loads of money? Well, that's not going to make people feel very important. You know, if it's something that's inspiring, if it's passionate, if it's short, if somebody can explain why the owner set up the bar or restaurant to do this, then they're far more likely to work towards that as a guide. The one I always love is, in the last seven days, I've received praise or recognition for doing good work. I don't know about you, but when I was a manager, I was the hawk of doom. I'd basically fly around the room looking for you fucking up and then pounce on you and say, don't do it like that, I can't believe you did it, I can't believe you didn't upsell that product, etc. What I didn't realise is it was very bad at saying, well done, you did that brilliantly. I heard the way you answered that telephone call, that's awesome. I don't know what you said to that lady over there on table six, but she's smiling and laughing and that's a universal sign that people are happy. So, when I realised that I was very good at pointing out people's problems, but very bad about recognising that they did well, a friend of mine, a manager, said, I have the same problem. All I did was very simple. I got 10 coins, and I put them in my right-hand pocket. And over the course of the shift, my job on that shift was to find 10 things that I could say, that was done well, or well done, or thanks a lot for that, helping out. And every time I saw something good and said something, I'd take a coin from one pocket, put it into the other. And it got me really good at finding things to compliment. And the more I complimented people, the more people did good things. It was incredible. They felt that they were being recognized, even if it was just doing their job the way they were supposed to do their job. Like, that is something that, in this industry, we need to be better at saying, well done. You made that drink right, you garnished it right, you didn't spill liquid on the outside of the glass, you presented it in the right way. Well done. We're not very good at doing that. So the idea is for these 12 questions, they're all based around growth, recognition, trust, and communication. My work, my opinion seem to count. Okay, well, what are you doing to make people to say yes to that question? Like how are you, have you got a system where people can express an opinion? In your bar meetings, is it you standing there, talk, 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 right now, get to work? You need to give people the opportunity to express an opinion. You may not use that opinion, but as I say, as long as it's listened to, and if it is used, then as I say, you give recognition for it, it's important. So if you look at these 12 questions, I tend to think, okay, this is what leadership looks like. What are you doing to make all of your staff say yes to all of these questions? Because it's not just about management. There's someone at work who encourages my development. My supervisor or someone at work seems to care about me as a person. Now that may not be you, but you as a leader need to explain to the managers that you need to care about the people who work for you. You need to inspire them, to motivate them, to not look at all of their employees as a bunch of shift dodging, cash stealing, whatever people, but as real human people with real human problems. And the idea of you motivate them to care about people, they care about the people underneath them, so the people answer yes to this question. I love it as a, a survey, as a tool. You know, it is my biggest test of how I behave as a manager or as a leader. Am I setting it up so that when people will ask these questions anonymously, with no fear of being fired, etc., and then when the results come back, I can look at what people, 50% of people said yes, 50% of people said no. Okay, now I know what I need to focus on. Now I, need to know, now I know what I need to work on moving forward. This is one of the most important tools for the culture in a business. 
And culture is a fashionable word within our industry, in all industries at the moment. Culture is basically how do your staff behave when you're not watching them. And a great leader is someone who sets people up so that, they say, when you're not watching them, when you're not there, it goes along. A lot of people have said about my current job, it's like, are you going to be bartending? I'm like, nope. And they're like, you know, are you going to, have you changed the cocktail list yet? I'm like, nope. And I say to people, I'm the coach. I don't step on the field of play. All of my work is done off the scenes. I don't go up and serve tables, I don't make cocktails, I don't greet guests at the door. I'm setting the teams that do that up for success. I'm leading them, and I might demonstrate how it could be done, but they need to learn how to do it themselves with my support. The managers who manage them need to know how and why it's important to do so. So I talked before to have to discuss and we start to answer yes to it. There's four ideas that people are engaged in a job if you set them up with growth. So when you're teaching them new things, and those new things may be how to drink water, which may seem really odd, but has anyone ever taught you about how to drink water? Like a pint of water, stupid idea. Body can't process it quickly enough, whereas the same pint of water in three small glasses, done over a slightly different length of time, that would actually lead to hydration properly. The first thing John Wooden used to do with his basketball people, and remember this is college basketball in America, so you know, these are great basketball players who have to go to college in order to get to the NBA. The first thing he would do with them is help to put their socks on. And they'd be like, what the fuck, coach? I've been putting socks on since I was like five years old. He's like, yeah, but has anyone taught you how to do it? And they're like, no, I don't need to roll it on. And it's like, nah, let's go back and look at that again. And guaranteed, all the markets would say, you know, I get less blisters on my feet now. That's that marginal gain. A little bit better leads to bigger results. But it sets that aspect of humility and also that you're caring for people moving forward. Trust. Can you be trustworthy? Do your employees trust you? Do the people that follow you trust you? Are you consistent in your behavior? Are you fair? Are you honest? Do you have integrity? And you can work on integrity. People can change, of course they can. Recognition. Are you providing when people do good work? Are you telling them? Are you saying that success is entirely down to me? Well, unless you're the only person there, of course it isn't. Recognizing people when they do well, Recognition is important. Finally, communication. Do people know why you exist? Do people know why you set up the bar? Do they know why you've made these changes? And do they have an opportunity to make suggestions back, express their opinions, and have a sense of, not necessarily of ownership, but a sense of control within their business? So I think leadership is really about those four major qualities. We talked about inspire to break it down a little bit, but that, in my element, are the skills of leadership that can be taught. They said, we should have some examples of leaders. And I thought about that, just doing this upstairs. Bobby Hugel, without a shadow of a doubt, is, I think, the greatest leader in our industry right now. This is a man with integrity and opinions. This is a man who looks beyond our industry. You know, he runs an agave bar. He will only stop brands when he's visited, but he's checked out exactly how ethical and sustainable they are. He loves mezcal, but doesn't want mezcal to be big because he can see the social problems that come from monoculture in Mexico. He stops only ethical runs. This is a person who his ethics are at the heart of everything he does. The success of his bars is not down to him, it's the people he's hired who've gone on and taught him things, etc. I think if we had more Bobby Hugels in our industry, but more importantly, if you look at him and what he does and how he does, he would never claim to be a leader within our industry. Within his organization, yes, he would. Julie Ryan out of New York, and of course, Peter Dorelli, who I think points more than anything else, but what he's done and how he's done it shows that this isn't just a younger generational thing, but it's actually something that you can continue to learn and grow, and he's only got better as he's gone on. So, 57 seconds late, left. Thank you for coming today. AngusWinchester at gmail.com is my email. I'm happy to send you this presentation. I'm happy to have any more discussions, talk about books, talk about other people with qualities and things like that. But thank you so much for coming along. I hope it was interesting. I hope it was useful. I hope you have a great rest of the show and now we'll fuck off.
Você é a matadora.